Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our SETI Life. Uh, my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a researcher at the SETI Institute, and today we are going to talk about Proxima D, a new planet recently discovered around the nearest uh, uh, stars Proxima Centauri. And for this, we invited Joao Faria. Hello, Joao. How are you? Hello, Frank. Hello. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So uh, you are calling us from uh, the from, from Porto for the exactly. Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences. That's correct. Porto in Portugal, exactly. In Portugal. Uh, I'm gonna try in in Portuguese. Instituto de Astrofisica e Ciencias do Espaço. Eh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying. So, uh, Joao, you are the first author of this paper. Uh, announcing this discovery that was published, uh, I will say, like a month ago, even less. A bit uh, less, yeah. Yes, in uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics. And the name of the paper, it's in the link, it's called, it's called A Candidate Short Period Sub-Earth Orbiting Proxima Centauri. And it's a paper available to everybody. So if you want to know more, you can have a look at this. Um, so the SETI Institute is very interesting, of course, in this uh, discovery because uh, Proxima Centauri is uh, the closest star uh, to us. It's only 4.2 light years away from us. So very, it's very small distance. It's 40 trillion kilometers. You can convert that in miles if you want, but it's almost the same, we will say. Um, it will take us, I will say, 18,000 years to go there. So <laughs> with the current oh, technology we have. So yeah. we cannot go there. So I'm, I'm assuming that you made this discovery using a ground-based telescopes. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, we cannot go there just yet. <laughs> uh, and we, we used uh, an instrument that is called Espresso uh, that is installed at the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, uh, the part of the European Southern Observatory in Chile. As, as many telescopes, uh, this one is also in, in Chile, and uh, uh, it's actually one of the, or a group of four of the biggest telescopes in the world, the, mm -hmm. the VLT. Uh, and we use this instrument called Espresso. Um, Espresso is a spectrograph um, that is installed uh, in the VLT and can actually use uh, light, so can collect light from either of these four uh, telescopes. Um, would you mind if I, if I showed you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Couple of pictures from Go ahead. Of, the, of the instrument and the telescope itself. So I think you can see it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So here it is. Here is the, the four UTs, unit telescopes of the of the VLT. And Espresso actually has an um, interesting characteristic that it can, as I said, uh, use the light from either of the four telescopes, or it can combine the lights from, from all four of them and into, so making the light go into uh, one uh, spectrograph, one with optical fibers. Uh, and what Espresso does is, is basically record the spectra of stars. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that's, that's what we use it for, to record the spectra of stars in order for us to, to see their, what their light, um, so to decompose their light in different wavelengths and to see tiny uh, motions, tiny movements uh, of the stars. And these then we assume are caused by, by exoplanets. So you uh, don't see the exoplanet directly once again, you see the effect of the exoplanet on the star. So exactly. you see the wobble motion, the slight motion of the star. Yeah, and, Be because, and the the yeah because the planet, uh, if the planet is around the star, then it pulls the star back and forth, and we see it move, going away uh, and getting closer to us. So that's remarkable that Espresso, I didn't know that Espresso was an instrument that could be used on, on any of the UT. Uh, it's a fiber instrument then, I'm assuming? It, it, exactly, it's a fiber fed uh, spectrograph. So uh, very simplistically, there are fibers going from, from each of the telescopes into the instrument, which is actually in the middle of the, it's in this small building here in the middle of the, of the four, four UTs. Uh, and so it can use either one of them, or it can combine the light, as I said. And typically, we don't combine the light from the four of them to search for exoplanets. We sometimes do that when we are looking at very, very faint 
uh, objects like uh, quasars and galaxies very far away because espresso doesn't just do exoplanets it also does uh, cosmology and uh, other other science in which it's more useful to have the bigger telescope we have the better okay so we're going to go back to the instrument so after that so this instrument's been used so to, you point one of the UT to war, uh, to our Proxima, cent, uh, Pro, Proxima cent, Century, the star, exactly. which is uh, M dwarf, right? If I remember. Exactly. It's a small M dwarf, uh, less massive and less uh, hot than the sun. Okay. And so you need a lot of big telescope to be able to capture enough light to be able to see, uh, to, be, to be able to diffract the light and see the absorption band. I'm assuming. That's, uh, that's what you do concretely? Um, yes, in, in practice, yes, we, we uh, divide the light into, into its uh, wavelengths, let's say. That this is what the sp uh, espresso is a, in a shell spectrograph, which basically means that uh, you also divide it in, in basically in a 2D image, in a okay. two dimensional plane, uh, to be very, very simple. Um, what is useful in having such a big telescope, so the VLT, each of them is an eight meter telescope. And it's, this is useful because Proxima Centauri and other stars is a very faint um, target, a very faint star. So we cannot see it with the naked eye. We cannot, and the bigger telescope, um, the, the better we see it, the mm -hmm. more light we, we get. Okay, so before we go through the detection, I want to say hi to all our viewers where people watching us from London, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Jakarta, Indonesia, Indonesia, Canada, Antwerp in Belgium, Rochester, the San Francisco Bay Area, Vermont, Texas, New Jersey, Lebanon, Mauritius. Oh, someone from the island nearby my island. I'm from Reunion Island. That's why I say that. Indianapolis, mm -hmm. Transylvania, Nashville, Missouri, Norway, Finland, Italy. Bandung, Indonesia, North Carolina, Argentina, and India. So everybody is interested in hearing about Proxima Century D and you uh, Proxima D and your discovery. So let's go try straight to the discovery then. Let's go. Uh, let's yeah. go. Yeah. Very nice to see to see so many so many different places. <laughs> uh, let me share this this with you. So to explain you what what we did, what, how we actually went in practice, um, we pointed uh, espresso or the uh, VLT at Proxima mm -hmm. and we record the radio velocity. So we this measure of how the star is, is moving. And we do this over time, right? Over several years, several, several months, several years. Uh, and we observe it changing. So the star uh, indeed is uh, changing velocity. And because of that, we infer that there is a planet uh, around it, okay? And you see here, the um, more or less how the, how the observations went. We started observations back in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so this first set of blue and red observations. And at the time, using this uh, smaller data set, we were already able to confirm Proxima B. Proxima B was the first planet uh, detected in this, ar around this star. So back, it, was, it was detected back in uh, 2016 we were able to confirm this planet and to measure its mass. But we saw hints of another signal, uh, a much smaller signal. And so we wanted to, to continue observing the star. Then the pandemic made, um, uh, changed a bit our plans. The observations were interrupted for, for some months uh, in the observatory, but we did get uh, a set of new observations afterwards that allowed us indeed to confirm this uh, new candidate planet, Proxima D, which is orbiting at a much um, at a smaller uh, orbital period. So it takes about five days to, to, to go around the star. Mm -hmm. uh, so one year in Proxima D takes about five days. <laughs> let's, let's put it like that. Um, I can show you in practice, uh, maybe it's um, don't worry about all the technicalities here, but uh, just to tell you one, two important things. The first one is that Proxima itself, the star, um, is not is not just a ball of quiet gas, right? So there, there's stuff going on in it. Uh, in particular, it has star spots 
just like the sun has sunspots. And what this means is that the radio velocity that we measure is not just because of the planet or the planets, it also because it's also because of the star. And that means we need some uh, we need to be careful when we analyze the data in order to separate the two things: what is a star, what is a planet. Right. And here we, we use what, what we call an activity indicator. It's something else, some other measurement that tells us how the stellar activity is behaving so that then we can disentangle the, that variation from the planet. But you see that clearly there were the two signals here, uh, one that comes from Proxima B and another that comes from Proxima D, this new, uh, this new candidate planet. Okay, so yeah, for for our uh, viewers, it's we have a M dwarf star, Proxima Centauri. We have B detecting in 2016. You mentioned mm -hmm. yes. C in 2019, uh, yeah. and then so you've been observing this system, and in the system, in the signal, what you get is the variation of light and noise due to the star itself, because as you say, it's not a perfect ball of gas. Then you see the variation of the motion of D and, and uh, B and C. You remove that, and then you, have, you detect another signal, much fainter, because much, much smaller amplitude, much smaller exactly. magnitude, which is D. Which is right. D, exactly. The, just to explain that the amplitude of this signal that we see, so we see a periodic signal, something that changes with a given period. Every five days, it repeats uh, in the rate of velocities. And the amplitude of this signal depends on the mass of the planet. And so when we measure the amplitude, when we actually detect this signal, we can then infer the mass of the planet. And in this case, uh, Proxima D, we are talking about um, a planet or a candidate planet that has about 25%, so one quarter, the mass of the Earth, which is very, very light. It's a very light planet. Yes. Uh, and, and that means that it creates a very small signal. And that's why, first, why we need Espresso, why we need this big telescope, uh, and why we need to observe for a long time. Yeah. You can stop sharing. I want. To, I would like to go back sure. to that to, to this point because I think it's a very important point. But before, let me let me say hi to more people who join us from Omaha, Toronto, Singapore, Hawaii, or Croatia, New York City, Denver, Romania, Ostrava in Czech Republic. Ahoy, jak se mate? Mexico, Spain, and I would like to say to say thank you to Freddie for the stars. So let's go back to this. It's a very important point here. Because most people think that uh, astronomers just use a telescope once and point to our star and make a discovery. That's not the way it did happen, right? You show the figure where you have a lot of data taken. Yeah. You have to <laughs> deal with the pandemic on the top of that. And then there is a lot of data analysis. So uh, come question, did you go to the telescope to do these observations? Uh, yes. So. We do go to the telescope itself to, um, to observe sometimes. We don't do observations, let's say old school observations, actually at the, at the end of the telescope, we are controlling the telescope with, uh, with computers over fr from that small building that I showed you. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, we do go over there. Uh, not since the pandemic, we haven't been able to, to move there, but so we do our observations now remotely. Um, with, with the help of the astronomers in, in Chile. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, you, you mentioned, and I think it's also, is, it is a very important point that these discoveries, we don't just point the telescope, take a picture and see the planet, right? Uh, we have to look at uh, years of data, many times several years uh, of accumulated data observations. Um, and then we have to do an analysis of, of that data that, um, because the signals are, are so small, right? Yeah. Because, because they, are, they, they don't just pop up uh, like that. And so we have to look carefully at the spectra of the star and how the radio velocity is, is varying with time. Uh, and then it, it's quite, uh, the, the most challenging part is 
uh, often to separate this stellar activity part because the stellar activity of the stars it's not just a simple periodic uh, signal like the planets and and so it's it's often complicated to separate it so yeah it, take, it takes time yeah so that's why in your paper there is uh, something like 20 co-author and uh, <laughs> everybody is basically uh, involved in one of the small part of the data analysis. Some are taking data, some are developing the codes to extract the signal from the data, some are developing the code to analyze the data, to remove the, the stars and variation, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. each of these people contributed somehow, sometimes it's just the finance, finance contribution to this project. So you're the lead author because um, you are uh, res the researcher that lead this project. Uh, tell us a bit more about how you came out to this research. Yeah. Uh, so, I it's true there, there is a there is a huge team behind Espresso behind uh, this analysis in particular, and so all the authors in in the paper at some point contributed to part of it, part of this work, and. Um, what, what happened with, with uh, myself is that I am involved in Espresso, so I'm an Espresso collaborator. There is a science team, right? So the people that work on Espresso data. And part of the goals of, of Espresso, uh, one of the goals of Espresso is to find Earth-like planets uh, around uh, Sun-like stars. So Proxima and Proxima D being one of them. And I was involved in this subgroup, let's say, of the, of the science team. And I was leading the project in the sense that I, I was carrying out the analysis, looking at the data as, as it arrived. Uh, so every time we do an observation, every time we have a new uh, radio velocity point, I would look, I would try to see, okay, is the planet signal still there? Um, how is it changing? And so um, all to say that I lead the, the paper itself, but it is a team work, definitely, because, yeah. because a lot of people, as you said, throughout all the process, transforming what comes out of the telescope into a planet <laughs> detection uh, takes a lot of work. So where uh, do you remember the first time you saw the signal and you have kind of uh, the feeling that you had discovered a third planet around Proxima Centauri? Yeah, so in the in the previous publication that um, I, I was second author there, and there was it was led by Alejandro Suarez Mascareño, our my colleague in in Spain. Um, there we saw the first hints, as I told you. We saw a tiny. This could be. We were not sure. And in this in the planet detection, we are always a bit um, careful to to make announcements, to make uh, claims of the planet because because there are, there are other things that can can indeed get in the way. Right? Mm -hmm. and so we, we want to be sure when we, when we claim a detection. Um, so what we did is, is what we have to do. We, we gathered more data, we observed for more for longer. Um, and at that time, we, we, we were not sure, as I told you. And then we started, as we get more observations, the, the signal didn't disappear, basically. And, and we started to be more confident that indeed it was a periodic signal and in, indeed it was due, due to a planet. Okay, so we talk about the detection, the instrument, etc. Let's talk about the planet. And I know there's people mm -hmm. asking questions about it. So we have discovered 5,000 or 4,000 officially in our planets, in our, in our galaxy, okay? Tell us about this one. What do you know? Yeah, so what we measure from our observations is um, two things mostly. The orbital period, as I told you, which is five days, 5.12 days. Uh, and so from the orbital period, we know the distance to the star, the distance that the planet is to the star, which is much closer than Mercury is to the sun, for example. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 0 0.03 uh, astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun. So 3% the distance Earth-Sun. Wow. Yeah, so we're okay. talking about the, the planet is much closer to, to Proxima. Uh, and then from the signal, from the detection of the signal, we also measure the planet's mass. Um, we actually measure the minimum mass 
because we don't know how inclined the orbit um, actually in reality it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so we measure a minimum mass, but that means that the mass could be slightly larger, but it's probably not much larger. And that is about 0 0.25, the, the mass of the Earth. Okay. And this low mass, both this low mass and the distance to the star already tell us a little bit. Uh, but one thing that we do, we do not measure directly is that the radius of the, so the size of the planet. And that's because we don't observe a transit. We, uh, so there is another detection, uh, exoplanet detection method that, that is the transit method. If we observe the, the planet passing in front of the star, we could measure its radius. In this case, uh, we, did not, we do not observe a transit because we think the planet actually doesn't transit. Okay. Um, so it means that the system is not seen age on, it's exactly. slightly tilted, so the planet orbit around the star without really never occulting the, the, the planet, the star the itself. Passing in front of the star, yeah. And this okay. is true also for Proxima b, um, which is probably not transiting as well. Uh, so we don't know the radius of the, of the planet. We can estimate it, we can have an idea, um, but the mass and the period already tell us a little bit here. So these low mass planets, uh, either Proxima b or Proxima d, um, they're probably rocky planets, mm -hmm. right? Uh, gas giants like Jupiter or like Saturn. Um, so they're probably made of rocks. Um, and then what we, we are not quite sure is if they have atmospheres uh, or not. Right. Yeah. So uh, this one is very close to its star. Do we know? Do we have an, an idea of if it was something like this, like the moon, what will be the temperature on the surface? You have an idea of this? Uh, yes, we we measure or we estimate something like uh, like two hundred eighty three hundred uh, Kelvin. Okay. Um, and and so we are, we are talking about a fairly hot uh, temperature in, in that sense. But, mm -hmm. uh, but this planet Proxima d is actually too close to the star. So it's outside of the, what we call the habitable zone. Um, this habitable zone is, is the region, the distance to the star where water can be in a liquid state. And the first planet in this system, Proxima b is inside the habitable zone. But this third one, this Proxima d, is actually too close to the star, and so it's it's hotter in that uh, in that sense. All right, uh, we're getting questions here. Um, so we're talking about Proxima D for those who join who are joining us and wondering which planet is that, mm -hmm. which is the closest uh, planet, the newest de planet discovered around the nearest system of uh, called Proxima Centauri. Um, so Joao, I'm um, I'm seeing questions here about. Uh, the contribution of the, of the next generation of telescope. Uh, someone is asking, uh, what do you expect uh, to be able to do with telescopes like the European Large Telescope, which is a 40 meter class telescope on the ground, or maybe JWST, or even Luvoir or Abex, one of those gigantic telescopes. What's the next step in the study of this planet specifically, or maybe the Proxima Centauri system? Yeah. Uh, I, I think there, there are two, that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much because, uh, but I think there, there's two important answers to, to that question. Uh, the first one is what those missions, those instruments will tell us about planets uh, in general, uh, but also because the, the Proxima Centauri is particular in some sense, but it might not be the ideal uh, target for for many of those um, of those instruments, and wh why do I say this? First, because it is the closest star to us. But as I said, the planets are too close to the star. Right? That's one one reason. The, the other reason is that the star itself is rather faint, uh, and so it's it's difficult to to actually observe um, with precision. But those future instruments, what they will what they could tell us is uh, what we still don't know about the planets. What I was saying that, do they have an atmosphere? Uh, for example, if we observed um, the, one of these planets during a transit, we could indeed measure directly 
the, the atmosphere as the starlight passes the, the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, but this is quite challenging to do first because uh, if the planets don't transit, uh, so in that case it's impossible. Um, but it's also challenging because the, the planets are so so small. We typically we tend to do right now we tend to do this for for giant planets like mm -hmm. Jupiter and Saturn. JWST and the other instruments in the future will tell us or will be able to do this for Neptune-like planets uh, around. So it would be super Earths, uh, planets that are larger than the Earth, not exactly for rocky planets like the size of the Earth or even smaller. So in that sense, the, these Proxima D, Proxima B are not the, the best uh, targets to learn uh, for, for those instruments, but we still would like to know indeed if, if they are, if they have an atmosphere. That's basically okay. the a big question. Um, before I have to I go to the next question, I would like to thank Linda for the stars as well, Ron. Uh, thank you very much for your donation. So um, you, your paper got a lot of attention. For the first time in my life, I clicked on the metric of an AA paper, which gave you the number of people who downloaded your paper or publish about it, which is kind of an impressive number because you're basically on the top 1% of the paper ever published in astronomy and astrophysics, by the way. I don't know if you know that. So congratulations, <laughs> first of all, because as a scientist, we, write, we spend a lot of time writing those papers. So we, it's kind of nice when you can you find out that people read them, okay? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this seems to be an interesting discovery not only for, for the general public as well, not only for us. So could you explain to us why? Why, why people are so interested in this discovery? Yeah, I, I think in this particular case, what, what brings the, um, the interest, what uh, makes us wonder is, is because the star is so close to us. Uh, it, it's just next door, right? It's just mm -hmm. after the sun is the closest star we, we know. And that uh, brings the question or makes us wonder, can we ever go there? Um, would it be possible for, for life to exist in one of these planets um, and for us to go visit or to see it, for us to, to actually detect life in one of these planets? I think that's, what, that's what's special about Proxima Centauri and that makes us wonder. Um, Maybe, maybe it, it gets a bit more attention than some of the other planets simply because of that, because most of the other planets, there are other um, habitable, um, so planets in the habitable zone of stars like the sun, there are many, quite a few others, um, but they're a bit further away. And so it, it's nice when we, I think it's important when we see that just close by, uh, we have these large system now with up to three planets there could be more uh, but when we see that this happens just here we i think we imagine that it's quite common uh, and these planets might be quite common and that's the the important part of it i think is that it shows planets like the earth could be uh, common in the universe and so we just have to find them and then see if actually they can have uh, life life and maybe we will be we will go there. And maybe in the future we, we might be able to go there. Exactly. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions. And I, I know we are short on time, so I don't want to take too much of your time. And you have more planets to discover. So can you just let's make a brief answer to each of them, okay? Okay. Uh, so someone, is that a pure optical detection? Uh, are you planning to do more multi uh, multi-wavelength observation? Will it be useful? Uh, yes, so in the sense, um, the VLT and Espresso observes in the optical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very, it's very good to observe in the near infrared, if we have a spectrograph in the near infrared, because the stellar activity behaves differently. And so that is very useful to, to help disentangle. But uh, Espresso right now is only observing in the optical. 
can you tell us if the planets are in resonance? Or do you see any more, any effect of the orbit on one planet and to the other one? Uh, they are not exactly in, in resonance. So they are close to a one to two or two to one resonance, but but they're not exactly in resonance. We don't see um, we don't see this this effect clearly. Okay. Um, are you going to reorganize <laughs> the names? Now we know that Proxima D is the closest. Are we going to name it uh, B C D A B C? What's the what's the plan? I, the names are quite confusing, and they are they are in this particular case for Proxima, they are just chronological. <laughs> so yeah. uh, B after so the, uh, it's B not A because the star itself is A. And then B, C, D is in chronological order. I think uh, right now it might be too late to, to reorganize. To organize it. We have to live with it. Who is in charge of giving them a full name, a real name? A real name? Um, there are some efforts by the uh, International Astronomical Union to, to actually name planets with given name, let's, mm -hmm. let's say. By default, they are all named star name plus B, C, D. Uh, which I, I I do agree, or I do think it's a bit, yeah, it could be better. <laughs> okay, yeah, there was an initiative like four years ago by the International Astronomical Union to name planets, and in fact they organized a gigantic competition of uh, exactly. to ask people for proposals, and uh, and there was it's interesting to see the name that were found. In fact, um, they were not named after the observer or the discoverer. They named after some significant name into the history or mythology of uh, pa several parts of the world. And I, I'm, I think it's a great idea. I hope we're going to continue this, even no, though maybe we could name this one Joao, this one Faria. Yeah. But uh, I, I was just going to add that I think it's a much better idea to not name them after the the researchers because these are. You, discoveries of all humanity, not not mine. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Erika, for the stars. I just saw that we received new stars from Erika. Um, oh, a very technical question. You ready? <laughs> do you conclude all these based on basic statistical analysis or do you use convolution neural networks or in any other form of deep neural networks to find those Earth-like planets? Uh, we don't use any machine learning techniques uh, so far. So it's, I wouldn't call them basic, but it's just statistics. <laughs> okay. It's, yeah, just statistic. I love when you say just statistic, because yeah. it's not just statistics. <laughs> There's a bit, a bit of <laughs> complexity to it. <laughs> okay. Um, about question about yourself. Uh, can you tell us? I mean, we have people watch, young people watching us. And they may want to know how they could become the next uh, Joao Faria of the in the next decade. So, what what did you do? What did you study? What's you uh, and what's your plan for the future? So, I I started my science career, let's say, by by doing a, a master's, which was actually not in in exoplanets. I studied uh, astro seismology before, so I was already interested in in stars and how they they work. Uh, but I, I did astro seismology. Uh, and then I, I kind of I got interested by the technical side of it, by the uh, statistics, by the practical, how do we actually do detection? And I went into a, a PhD that was about exoplanets. Uh, I used another instrument that was not espresso. It was HARPS, which is also known for, for its exoplanet discovery. Uh, and then I, I got inside uh, by... I, I continued working in radio velocities mostly, and I got inside Espresso and in the in the consortium, the Espresso consortium. Um, as a as a, I, I don't know if someone is thinking about should I become an astronomer? Uh, is is it fun? Uh, I think the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun to to understand how things work, how the universe uh, works, and. All you have to do, I think, is, is be curious and ask questions and try to understand your, the world around you. Right? That's, if, if you ask, keep asking questions, the answers will, will sh start show, showing up. And, and, and that's, I think, how you, how you do science. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Joao, for your time. For You're joining us.
Um, we hope to see you uh, again for another uh, discovery of another planet. Maybe this one will be habitable. <laughs> we see. <Hopefully. laughs> you know, SET Institute, we have a bias. We like habitable planet. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you very much. So we are the SET Institute, a nonprofit research organization based in uh, California, in Mountain View. Um, it's, um, this is a program, this is part of the outreach program of the SET Institute. So you can help us by following us on social media. We are on all of them. Uh, if you're watching this video right now and you like it, uh, click, uh, give us a thumb up, a like, share it, comment, ask questions. I'm sure Joao will be happy to answer to all your questions for if you have any that we did not answer during this, uh, this uh, uh, 35 minutes. Um, you can learn about us as well by visiting our website at city.org. Uh, you can make a small donation at city.org slash donate. And uh, this will help us uh, to continue this program and uh, to bring astronomy and the joy of uh, discovery of exoplanet uh, to, to you all. So thank you very much. And don't forget, next week we have a SETI Talks and we are going to talk about something very different but equally interesting, mysterious signals in the Milky Way in radio. And uh, this will be on March 23rd at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we invited two Australian-based astronomers, Tara Murphy and Natasha Early Walker, and they are going to tell us about this mysterious signal which has been detected and published recently. And I am sure this is going to interest our city audience, of course. So thank you, and uh, see you next week for the City Talks. I will be there. Thanks again, Joao. You take care, thank and you. Uh, see you soon in a conference or somewhere around the world. On